Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Thank you. If I may call uh, Mr. Blackburn. Yeah. Please stand and repeat after me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mr Blackburn, as you know, my name is Sam Stevens, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Please could I ask you to state your full name? Gary David Blackburn. Firstly, thank you for giving uh, evidence to the inquiry today, uh, and thank you for providing a written statement which, uh, to which I'd like to turn now. Uh, do you have a bundle of documents in front of you? I don't, actually. You don't? No. Right. Bear with me. I'll see where th that is. Apologies, sir. We'll uh, just wait while that bundle arrives. Sure, yeah. Now, one of those bundles should have your witness statement at the front of it, behind tab A. Yes, got that. Uh, apologies for that, and thank you. Uh, so that witness statement should run to 16 pages. Correct. And if you turn to page 15, uh, you'll see paragraph 28 being the last paragraph, and at the bottom, is that your signature? It is. And can I ask you to confirm that the facts within that statement are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. Thank you, Mr. Blackburn. That stands as your evidence in the inquiry. I'm going to ask you some uh, questions about that. You joined the post office in 1985. Yes, I did. And from 1985 to 1994, you worked, I, I understand, in Crown Office branches around Huddersfield. Correct. And then in 1994, you were posted to the North East Regional Office. That's correct. And at that stage, you say in your evidence that you worked on a relatively new help desk uh, that was created to support the region. That is also correct. And at this point, the, um, at this point, sorry, uh, the post office was split into seven regions. It was. And you say that subsequently those individual regional helplines merged into uh, become what we now know as the Network Business Support Centre. That's correct. Or the MBSC. The MBSC, yes. Uh, do you remember when that was? Um, it coincided with the introduction of the Horizon Solution. So prior to that, it was at the, the Northeast Regional Desk or the various regional desks were there pre-automation and then also for, I think it was called the Echo Plus system. So I'm fairly certain it, it was a part of a larger reorganization of the post office and um, the introduction of Legacy Horizon. And w casting your mind back to when you worked on the pre-MBSC desk and pre-automation desks, what were the types of inquiries you would most often receive? Yeah, it was, it was very transactional in nature. It was really supporting the ranchers in terms of how do I complete a particular transaction for a member of the public, uh, interspersed with uh, accounting queries, but um, as we may well end up discussing, nowhere near to the extent it was post-automation. That was the old paper-based cash account, which was relatively straightforward and, and simple to follow. Um, we also supported the retail network managers uh, at the time in any inquiries that they may have had. Um, and we were also there as uh, a bit of an emergency point of contact for events such as uh, burglaries and, and, and robberies, that kind of thing. And uh, what did you think of the quality of the advice and assistance that was able to be provided by the regional help desk in comparison to the national <laughs> one? Yeah, it was, in, in my personal opinion, um, better purely based upon the fact that it was staffed with people who had similar career profiles to myself, so that all worked 
um, in the branch network, primarily in the directly managed branches in the Crown offices, but one or two of my colleagues at the time had also worked in the independent uh, branches, so they got a, a wealth of experience of completing you know, the varied transactions that we had at the time in the business. So when, when you say in, in the regional um, health, as you, you pointed to the experience of the people uh, within it as a strength. Yes. Can you explain why that was different from the NBFC? It, in, well, when, so the regional helpline converted into the Horizon trial desk. So I was part of the trial desk then, which was run out of an office in, in Leeds. Um, I think the branches in the trial were from both the Leeds and Bristol regions, I want to say. Um, it was still very much the same group of people, albeit everything was new to all of us at that time in terms of Horizon itself. But the business knowledge was still the same, the transactions were still the same, although completed uh, in a different manner. Um, as we moved then into what was the national, uh, the Network Business Support Centre and the national, the only help desk for business inquiries, um, naturally we had to expand and recruit more people. Um, we moved from Leeds to a greenfield site um, in the Dern Valley. Um, it was um, fairly isolated at the time. There was one or two other uh, contact centres uh, in the environment, so we picked up uh, new recruits from the surrounding area, uh, people in effect who had, it was their first experience of working for the post office, they had no prior experience. So for me, naturally, there was just um, a, a slight diluting um, of the quality of the individual on the desk, um, as they obviously had to go through a steep learning curve themselves. So is it fair to say there was a loss of institutional knowledge when moving to the MBFC? Uh, that is my opinion, yes. And uh, for that reason, is it fair to say that because of that loss of institutional knowledge, it was important to ensure that the new members of the MBSC were adequately trained? Yes, vital, yes. We'll come on to training shortly. Before I do, the pre-MBSC regional helplines, or I appreciate you can only speak for the North East, um, but uh, did they ever have any communication, the helpline as such, with uh, people involved in bringing prosecutions against sub-postmasters for false accounting or theft? No, not at that time. No, it wasn't part of the remit. And uh, the same question, but in respect of auditors, were, was there any communication between the regional helpline and the audit teams? I can't remember, if I'm, if I'm honest. There may well have been, um, because regional auditing was a very you know, business-as-usual part of everyday post office life. So it, there may have been, but it's not something I recollect. So in, in paragraph four of your statement, we, which we don't need to turn to, you, you say that you were a team leader on the MBSC. Uh, could you just summarise um, briefly what that role entailed? It, it, it was um, line management of a, of a group of individuals who would be actually manning the telephones and taking the calls from the branches. Um, when we had busy times, I would also take calls from the branches, but it was providing a layer of people management and uh, support and guidance for any uh, calls that they were struggling to answer. And when did you finish that role as a team leader? Um, I think, well, this is where chronology becomes quite hazy for me, but I, I think it was, um, I'm going to say around about 2001, two, I think, um, and I went down what was downstairs uh, into business service management, as it was called at the time, and I picked Just up... pausing a, there, could you say what business service management's role was? Um, it's what I today would refer to as IT support, some ITIL processes, uh, change management, problem management, uh, secondary layers of incident management, things like that. And what was your, your first I, role? I started as a problem manager when I first went down there. Uh, and for how long did you hold that role? Now, that's the bit I, I really can't recall. I am, from, from memory, even looking through all of the documentation, I really have very little recollection of my time in that team. Um, I don't think it was for very long. 
um, because I seem to move on quite quickly into um, other incident facing and, and life service facing roles. So I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't tell you. We'll come to those roles in a moment. In, in brief terms, could you summarise what your role as a problem manager was? Yeah, and I think as I've said in my statement, it felt, um, looking back with hindsight, reactive uh, rather than sort of proactive in the sense that we would literally take um, uh, trends and analysis from the Network Business Support Centre. We'd also have it provided to us uh, by the Horizon System Help Desk. Uh, and we would look for where there was any uh, remediation activities that might be required to prevent future occurrences of you know, whatever the incidents had been. And uh, y your role after um, the problem, we don't know the date you, uh, specifically, but what was you, your role after that of a problem manager? So I, this is where my, my, my career, I do apologise, becomes quite hazy because I did so many roles, including uh, interspersed with taking parts in various programmes uh, from a support perspective. Um, my, my next uh, recollection was a... Um, uh, life service desk role that's that's the key role that I remember which was also a new desk that we'd set up at the time an internal facing desk we'll come to that again in due course but just just for the chronology's purpose it says you um, were transferred under 2p to Atos in 2014 that's correct uh, and could you just explain what Atos was doing at that stage for you to be 2p transferred across yeah, so Atos, in, um, for me, in simple terms, it was post office outsourcing that, what I just described as the business service management functionality, and it was implementing <coughs> a, a new operating model for, for management of post office's uh, IT supply chain. And uh, I understand that you left that role in 2017. I did, yes. And you no longer work for the post office. That's correct. Um, could we please turn up your witness statement on the screen? It's WITN 04650100. Uh, and paragraph 10, please, on page 6. Thank you. You state that the the purpose of the MBSC was to support the branch network through answering how do I related transactional queries alongside the Fujitsu Horizon Service Desk, uh, which was there to support the branch network with technical questions and queries in relation to the, the technology, hardware, software and network uh, that have been provided. What do you mean by how do I transactional questions? Uh, I mean literally, you know, a member of the public um, being in the branch, wanting to conduct a particular transaction type and the branch not being quite sure how to do that. At the time of Horizon, that also involved, you know, what were more complex um, navigational type questions through the solution. So that was that is what I would refer to as how do I, how do I, how do I, complete this transaction for, you know, an item going overseas or something to that effect. Uh, that was the type of things we did. Uh, that document could come down for the time being, thank you. Um, and uh, I think you've mentioned already a large part of the MBSC's role was to assist with balancing as well. Uh, very much so, yes, yes. Uh, what training did you receive uh, on joining the MBSC to uh, enable you to carry out your role as team leader? I think the only training that I, I remember was training on the Horizon solution. So there was no additional sort of business training or anything like that. It was a standard counter training course as it was at that time, which included use of the Horizon system. Do you recall what that training involved? I'm sorry, I don't. And what about the new candidates, so the, the people who hadn't the institutional knowledge that you had? Did they receive the same training or different? I, I believe, well, number one, I believe they, def, you know, they received that element of training because the Horizon system was now ultra important. But I think they also received the stand, what I would call the standard post office training as if they were going to go and work in a directly managed branch, for example. Do you recall if there was ever updater or refresher training given to members of the MBSC 
on how to use the Horizon system. Not specifically, no, I don't. I'd like now to turn to the relationship between the MBSC and the help, the Fujitsu help desk, which you've mentioned in your statement. Please, can we turn up FUJ 0008040405. This is the ICL pathway slash post office counter limited interface agreement for the network business support center uh, and the horizon system help desk. If you could turn to page four, please, towards the bottom. Under contributors, we can see that you, uh, the, the name on the right towards the bottom, you contributed to this document. Yeah. Uh, do you recall the level of input you had on it? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, but I would assume, given my role at the time, it was one really, you know, for, coming from a point of uh, managing a team of, of people who, who might possibly have to interact with the Horizon Service Desk or exchange um, ownership of an incident that had been logged. Please can we turn to page seven of that document. So section five sets out general responsibilities. And under H, it says, um, I'll summar uh, summarize, Post Office Counters Limited and ICL Pathway are responsible for ensuring that known problems or events that may impact on everyday business of MBSC and HSH are made known to both help desks. Can you recall how um, the bodies, the MBSC and the Horizon Service Help Desk, communicated with each other regarding um, problems with the Horizon system? At that time, when, when we were talking a legacy Horizon opposed to HNGX, the, the two desks were very distinct. In fact, the responsibility in effect had been passed to the branch network to determine which number they rang uh, and therefore who they spoke to. So I do remember there being a lot of uh, interaction between the two desks in terms of uh, swapping ownership. I can't, we, we also had, the MBSC had an admin team that that if there was a, a, a wider sort of unplanned event that was impacting either desk or a large volume of uh, calls suddenly started to come into the desk, they would take the responsibility for the, the, the interface and the communication. Um, I don't really remember anything further, I'm afraid. Well, if we, it may help you assist your memory if you look at page 16. Um, Uh, the section nine uh, describes daily interactions, which we, I don't need to um, trouble you with. But if we can go to 10, yeah. the MBSC HSH review forum says the performance of work undertaken across the MBSC HSH interface will be the subject of monthly review. The output of the review forum will provide input to the Horizon Service Review Forum. Right. Um, were you involved, or do you recall being involved in these monthly reviews? I, I don't, but given my role, um, I would be very likely to have been involved in at least some of them. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll ask the question, but I, I can assume the answer. You, you don't recall the types of matters which would have been discussed in these meetings? Um, it would have been primarily contact centre focused, I would imagine, um, but... Um, it wasn't really the, as I recall, it wasn't really the forum for raising of concern around, let's say, the performance of the solution. 
if, if we'd have had an incident that we couldn't answer with the information that we had and the knowledge that we had on the desk, and we felt it was um, the system, let me say, not working in the way that we had understood it should work, we'd have passed that at the time down into the post office business service management function, a second level of incident management and problem management for them to investigate and determine whether or not you know, there was something deeper that needed um, Fujitsu support and investigation. It was very contact centre focused, um, was the uh, MBSC, HSH and the reviews. So w when you said it would, pay, if there's a problem, you feared a problem with the system, it would be passed to a different team. Would that it, be the problem management team? It, it would have been, and it had gone in a much more timely manner. It had gone at the time that the event occurred rather than, you know, post a monthly review. And your evidence is, uh, to the best of your recollection, this review form mainly concerned the maybe operational or contact uh, centre elements of Volume the, of calls, or, types of calls, absolutely, to see whether there was a need to uh, produce knowledge articles for the advisors in the MBSC or or perhaps even suggest that there may be reminders that need to go in the counter news article out to the wider network, but not really focused at all on the technology. Another purpose of this document um, was to delineate the role, w uh, which calls would go to the NBSC and which to the Horizon uh, or the HSH, later HSD. Can we turn to page 18, please, which should be an appendix. Yes, that's right, <clears throat> not formally an appendix, but this is the table I was uh, looking at. We, we see here on, on the left column, postmaster incident, and the first two are um, unable to log on. And if it was because of a system failure or user error, the Horizon Service Help Desk would deal with it. So if, uh, uh, but if it was a lost password, we see the third line, it was the MBSC. So this was s separating those, those roles. Um, and the last entry, cannot use the Horizon counter system or part of the system, refers to matters such as... Oops. Sorry, we'll just wait for that to, to come back on screen. Thank you. Um, the, the last entry... Here we're talking about monitor failure or equipment failure, which results in the uh, sub-postmaster not being able to use the system, and that, that's clearly a help desk issue, a Fujitsu issue. Yes. Could we turn to page 20, please? Bottom two entries, uh, one says has an EPOS discrepancy um, and the next is a weekly one. Uh, that's referring to uh, an issue in the cash account when balancing, isn't it? Yes. And in both cases, the, it says the first contact is the, um, the Fujitsu help desk. And the comment says, HSH are responsible for assisting the PM in the correction of the discrepancy. However, if HSH cannot resolve an EPOS discrepancy, the PM will be referred to MBSC for approval to accept the discrepancy. And in both situations, the cause is listed, the sole cause is listed as user error. Can you explain why this document doesn't refer to uh, what to do if there's an EPOS an EPOS discrepancy caused by the Horizon IT system? Um, no, I can't. I, all I can say at the time, um, and this is a long time ago, when we were first automating the network, um, there was no belief or understanding at my level, at my operational level, at my team's level, that there was any reason to distrust the technology. So, you know, we were told quite clearly, in fact, on numerous occasions throughout my time, that there were no horizon integrity issues and there were no systemic 
issues. So at the, at the time, I think the, the stance would probably have been the solution works as per post office's requirements, as per the design. Therefore, there wouldn't be um, such a situation arise. I, I'm assuming that that would have been the stance, rightly or wrongly. At, at this time, can you recall who was saying or telling you that the system was robust? So this is in um, 2000. Uh, I can't be specific, but I'd have to say the wider business. I can't remember the names of the senior managers or the leaders of the program and the rollout, um, I'm afraid, at the time, although I do remember Don Gray because Don Gray was Northeast Regional Office, so that's where I, I came across Don. I knew he had some role to play within that. Um, but the general message was one which I can understand, look at, even looking back, of trying to ensure that you know operational people had confidence to go about the processes that we'd been that had been implemented and what we were asked to do on a daily basis you've mentioned don gray are you aware of whether the the met this message of that horizon was robust did, did that are you aware whether that came from any higher than don gray i'm sorry i, I couldn't say um, you, you, you said it as well in your evidence that it, it wasn't just then that message was repeated. Yes. Can you provide other examples? I know we're jumping ahead, but other examples um, of when you were told that the system was robust? Well, I, I guess as well there was a... I suppose I've got to try and convey the... and give context. So, you know, it was a massive transformation for the post office from manual to automation. Of course, we were all understanding of it was that or post office ceases to be relevant and probably exist. So we understood the journey and the strategy. Um, we, we didn't go into it doubting it, I guess, is what we were saying. We went into it accepting that it, it was going to work, no reason to challenge it at that stage. Now, over time, evidence obviously started to come in. We had improved knowledge, improved experience, over that same time frame. Therefore, we became much more comfortable with um, our ability to question or challenge or certainly escalate Fujitsu to investigate something when it wasn't working correctly. Legacy Horizon, that was incredibly difficult because of the you know, steep learning curve that we were all, we were all on. Uh, probably not brave enough either, if I'm honest, looking back to challenge some of the things when maybe we weren't sure. Um, so I can think of when it, when it started to be in the press, when there were postmasters who were starting to take, I think, personal litigation, then I think there were more frequent messages to uh, reaffirm that Horizon was robust, Horizon integrity was, was there, uh, and there weren't issues. I think there was also a third party I think it was called Second Sight Inquiry. Uh, even post that, I remember the message being the same. Uh, and I think there were also subsequent internal inquiries undertaken. And I might be in HNGX uh, chronology now uh, to um, also check. And I think that might have been done from my colleagues in product and branch accounting can't remember the names of any of the individuals, I'm afraid. Uh, and that also confirmed, and, and that those messages were filtered down to the operational teams. Um, we'll actually, we'll come to that bit of the chronology later on. Back to, to 2000, when this document was being created, and the message was, and I think you said the belief was that the system was robust. Yes. Do you accept that document and... and is, is one of many which is setting up support services that were to be made available to sub-postmasters using the Horizon Help Desk? Yes. Or the MBSC? Yes. And is it fair to say that those systems that were put in place to provide assistance to them um, were built on an assumption that the Horizon system was robust? Correct. Um, Moving then to knowledge sharing within the MBSC, we're going to come to some examples of problems later on. Uh, it's uncontroversial that there were problems in the Horizon IT system. As a matter of generality, 
how, uh, when, you, when someone in the MBSE at the top became aware of a problem, how was that shared amongst the other members of the team? Within the MBSE environment itself? Yes. Um, it, it was verbally cascaded. Uh, we also had um, bulletin boards, um, or there was uh, ad hoc and frequent um, team meetings where the information was provided. Now, I can't remember the exact introduction, but I don't think it was at the very, very beginning of, of um, the MBSC, but we also introduced knowledge articles. And those knowledge articles ultimately over time um, became, I would say, mandatory in terms of their usage. You had to use a knowledge article. You had to associate the call that you'd had, the ticket that you'd logged, with the knowledge article that you would use to advise and guide the caller. Um, and there was a team of people set up to um, produce those articles, manage those articles, maintain those articles. So that was the other method. Now, naturally, if there was something uh, fresh or new came in that was slightly unexpected or the timing wasn't great in terms of internal communications, there would sometimes be a gap between the go live of, of, of that, say, new transaction or that knowledge, whatever it was, and the creation of that knowledge article. So that's where we fell back on the more manual methodologies that I just mentioned, which would really be ensuring people were informed word of mouth, emails and bulletin boards. Do you recall when um, this change occurred, when it was mandatory to rely on knowledge articles? I think it was after I had gone down to the business service management function uh, and in fact, myself and one of my colleagues, Sean Turner, um, were involved in supporting the initial setup of a number of you know, existing processes in terms of the documentation. Could you just describe what a knowledge article looks like? Um, it, it, it would literally be a, a, a Word document. It was put onto uh, the uh, remedy. It, was, it sat independently, but accessed via what was the call logging system, the remedy system. Um, it could involve anything. It could involve counter news articles that were literally just almost copy and pasted into an electronic format. Um, it could involve process flow maps with you know swim lanes in terms of start and a finish and different people who might need to be inter in, uh, interact or involved. Um, it could involve diagrams. There were, there were pictorial uh, evidence as well to show what screens look like um, in terms of trying to guide uh, the, the, the MBSC agent and the court and, and the office. To what extent were the use of scripts you, uh, in, used in the MBSC call scripts? There, there may have been a script on occasion. Normally I would have said that would come off the back of an unplanned event of some description, something that's happened untoward and therefore there'd be a scripted response given. I don't actually remember a time where we were told quite, you know, precisely to follow almost word for word um, a script, but that'd be the, the, the situation where we'd have something that was perhaps temp more temporary in nature than the more permanent uh, way of responding to the inquiries. So perhaps to in response to a major incident? Perhaps response to a major incident, yes, yeah, something that's occurred that branches may call in about and need to be aware of. Uh, were you ever aware of sub-postmasters being told um, by members of the MBSC that they were the only person experiencing problems using the Horizon IT system? No. I, I mean, that's not something I certainly would have told my team, um, I don't, that sounds, I, I'm offering an opinion here, but that sounds slightly rogue to me rather than anything that would have been directed. That's internally to post office. Were you aware of the, anything along the same lines being communicated to uh, people working on the Fujitsu help desk? Uh, no, I didn't really have a great deal of visibility of, of their internal ways of working. I want to move now to your problem management role. Uh, and please can we bring up uh, paragraph five of your witness statement on page two. And I'll, I'll 
read the last line and then go over the page, um, what you say is, but what I do remember is that the role was largely reactive in nature, not particularly predictive or preventative, and therefore a lot of the work that I would have undertaken alongside my colleagues came from analysis of the calls that had been received by the MBSC um, or thematic incidents. I can come down, thank you. In, in general terms, what were the types of problems that you were seeking to analyse from these call records? It, you were looking for any any trend at all in terms of a, a volume of call, a particular type of, of, of call, business in nature, potentially technical in nature, and, and absolutely uh, in relation to accounting. Anything that might indicate there was a way of us operating better, doing something better, or something potentially that needed fixing. When you say that the role was um, not particularly predictive, what, what do you mean by that? I think, it's, uh, again, I come back to a bit of a chronology and a bit about the learning curve and everyone being um, you know, on the same journey, very difficult uh, back in the, time, uh, in, in the day when I think about it. I, I guess I'm trying to suggest that we probably had limited capability of predicting what might happen, and we were learning through experience what could happen. So to start with, the problem management role in my time was very much just simply reacting to what had already occurred. Hopefully, we would learn from that lesson, though, and, and increase and mature over time in terms of the ability to look out for certain things and prevent things from being repeated. Um, that, that's kind of what I mean about it being largely reactive at the time I was the problem manager. In your role as problem manager, would you have benefited from more internal uh, technical support, technical IT support? Oh, without doubt. I have no personal technical background whatsoever. Um, post office man and boy, business uh, training, yes, I could answer transactional queries and help postmasters. I've done the job. Um, Technology-wise, no. Um, I felt that we were in a position where um, Fujitsu were the chosen supplier. Um, if we needed to go to Fujitsu, I'd go to Fujitsu. Uh, whatever Fujitsu came back with, it was incredibly difficult to challenge, if at all, if it was technical. If it didn't feel right, if there was something that wasn't sitting well with you, um, we had a few strategic individuals in the business that we could go to and ask them to have a, a, a look. People like um, Ian Trundle and Bob Booth, are two people I know particularly supported me, um, not necessarily with accounting issues, but with certainly um, large-scale uh, geographic incidents that we had. Um, but no, I, it, we were very much trusting the supplier for the technical knowledge. Um, just on that, could please could we bring up page five of your witness statement? And the paragraph at the top. I think this is relates to evidence you just, just gave. Uh, you say that the post office IT funct function did have a team of business relationship managers run by Chris Taylor that were technical. Yeah. Just to clarify, those are different, aren't they, from the managers who would, say, contract managers who... Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, those guys were all based down in London. They were very much working with the business from a um, innovation and a future transactional perspective, but all of them naturally very, very technical and understanding in terms of the Horizon system. So they weren't there for us to be used on a process. You won't find it written in a document, you know, escalate to Chris or the team, but we did lean on them when we felt it was um, necessary. And again, you refer to Ian Trundle and Bob Booth. You say, whilst also supportive, these individuals' teams were primarily strategically focused and not designed to be regularly engaged in the operational day-to-day -day running. Um, what do you mean by strategically focused? Um, on, on next steps, on, on, on the future, on development of um, software, it tended, as I said, to be linked, uh, to my knowledge, to business um, activity rather than um, you know, focusing entirely on the technology. But they were the people who would 
from my perspective, interact with Fujitsu on a very regular basis in terms of how the solution worked. I'm sure they were both involved in an awful lot of program activity and an awful lot of um, determining post offices' requirements of the technology. Thank you. Uh, did you ever request at the time for more IT, internal IT support on the operational day-to-day -day matters for, uh, to, to be able to test what Fujitsu was no, saying? No, I, I, I don't believe that um, we did. Again, that sort of stems from um, a belief of there are no issues with the Horizon system. So um, at, back in HNG or um, Horizon Legacy, I think you refer to it, um, it was part of the learning curve again. So it, it just didn't really necessarily occur um, at the time. Um, I'm going to come on now to some of the processes involved in problem management. And we have a distinction between incident management and problem management. Yeah. And the inquiries heard evidence that incident management relates to dealing with the symptoms of a particular issue, such as a um, server failure. Uh, whereas a problem looks at the underlying causes of the incident. Is, do you broadly agree with that? Yes, my role in incident management was <coughs> always focused on um, surface restoration. Um, and then, you know, ideally we'd identify the root cause, but if not, that was always part of problem management's job once handed off. Um, please, could we bring up the document FUJ000? Seven nine nine four six. This is a, a post office account customer service major incident escalation process. And is this something you would have um, worked towards, well, worked with when dealing with major incidents? Yes, I'm, I'm fairly sure. Looking at the post office uh, distribution list, those two gentlemen were either my line managers at one point in time um, or line managers, line managers, so David, Dave Holbert and Richard Ashcroft. Could we turn to page seven, please? I should say, sorry, that document was dated 3rd of October. Um, 2006. And under the heading process objective, the fourth bullet point says one of the objectives was uh, to avoid unnecessary alerting of the customer. Uh, in this context, who was the customer, a sub postmaster or the post office itself? My reading of that would have been um, clients would be another way of looking at it. So at the time, a major one was um, well, there were Alliance and Leicester at the time, um, I think. Um, so it would, I think, it's referring to them rather than to the branch network. I see. So um, the clients of the post office. Yes. And w uh, what do you understand from the the, the purpose of, of of avoiding unnecessary alerting? Um, just doesn't sound right, does it, when I read it um, today at all? I, I'd be guessing, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. It's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? Um, it? I don't know if it was just purely wanting to protect brand. We have the, the last uh, and f four bullet points up. D demonstrate to the post office a more professional approach and improved governance. Um, had there been before this document a uh, what was perceived to be a, a lack of a professional ap approach from Fujitsu, from your perspective? I don't actually know if I'm honest, because this does. Is this 2006? Sorry. I think so. if we could just come, just to double check, if we can come out to the broad, uh, to the full page, please. Thank you. Ah, sorry, 2005, 2005 27th of June, 2005. Isn't it? Um, no, I, 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 if, I'm, if I'm being honest and it is recollection, no, I, I don't remember there being poor governance. Um, perhaps on occasions communication was inconsistent, 
we want to look at it that way, but I don't remember there being governance issues, but it might be more appropriate question for David uh, Holbert or Richard Ashcroft. Could we turn to page eight, please? The, uh, the, the bullet point at the bottom uh, of this, uh, the, well, the penultimate one now, says um, the Fujitsu Service Delivery Manager or Duty Manager out of hours is responsible for communicating both up to the Fujitsu organisation and across, see Appendix A, to their counterpart in Pol. Now, in your experience of dealing with incident management, did you feel that Fujitsu kept you um, appropriate, or the post office appropriately aware of any incidents as they arose? Well, they certainly made us aware of the incidents when they arose. Um, it would be difficult, I guess, for me to second guess that and um, challenge whether or not it was always done in a timely manner or whether it was always um, exactly what they knew at the time. Um, it, it, it would be the communication, basic communication, i.e. would they call our duty manager out of hours to tell us there was an issue? The answer is yes. Well, at the time, do you recall having any concerns that to put it blunt, bluntly, you were being kept in the dark about any incidents? I, I don't have any particular evidence, but on occasions when you finally ended up with the full root cause analysis and the full documentation of the events, the timeline, etc., there would be a ability to reflect and think that it hadn't been your experience in terms of the timing of, in terms of the quality of, the information that you were being provided. When you say on occasions, how often would that be? Uh, rarely, rarely. Could we uh, please turn to page nine? And under incident classification, uh, it says, as a general rule, a major incident will always be an incident rated as severity level A, critical, in the POA customer service incident management process details document. However, not all incidents rated as severity level A qualify. This is because the severity levels do not necessarily translate to the global business impact on Paul's business. For example, a single counter post office which is unable to transact, regardless of its business volumes, is rated as a severity A. Uh, it, it then goes on to say, for simplicity, incidents are classified into three impact levels and, and uses high, medium, low. Uh, w w was it, did an, Im uh, sorry, did an incident have to be a high I impact to be a major incident? I think this is where, um, I think the answer is yes and no. I'm sorry for that, but the way I remember the incident management process working was it, it's based upon knowledge and information at the time. So it, it, it perfectly reasonable for us on occasions to have what might turn out to be false alarms that have been raised through that way and, and, a, and a decision taken by Fujitsu in the first instance that it was a high. Uh, and therefore the process followed. Um, um, and it might end up high and remain high post understanding what the impact was, resolution and root cause. Equally, you know, or conversely, it could work the other way. Um, it could turn out that a decision was made by the Fujitsu duty manager that the incident was medium or low, and it might not have been rung through, but subsequently called through the following morning, often triggered by um, calls from the branch network, for example. If, if the incident wasn't declared a major incident and just, just an incident, uh, how did that affect the way it was investigated? It, it would be timing uh, more than anything. Um, 
in, in, in terms of waiting for the next, you know, the following working day, uh, excluding weekends as well. So there could be some significant delay for if a wrong uh, diagnosis was made in the first instance. But that would never stop. Um, it's that thing about reacting and predicting and preventing again. You get, you get into that kind of scenario where you might have been able to look back and think we could have done something sooner if it had been identified as high and therefore communicated. Um, but branches, you know, if they were open and they didn't have the ability to trade, they would call into one of the two desks. That in itself could also then trigger what would turn out to be the major incident management response. Looking then at problem management, if we could go to FUJ 79886 <coughs> uh, this is this is a twenty third of December two thousand and two, Fujitsu Services Post Office Limited interface agreement for the problem management interface, which is presumably a process you would have used as a problem manager. Yeah, I think that's about the right timing. Um, can we turn to? page seven of this document. And under 5.3, there are Fujitsu services specific responsibilities. It says Fujitsu services will update the problem management database daily as problems are updated. And Fujitsu services will provide Paul with remote access via dial-up to the Fujitsu Services Problem Management Database. Does, do you recall whether in your time as a problem manager you had access to that Fujitsu database? Yes. Um, I've got to say it wasn't the best experience. I seem to remember we had two machines that allowed us that dial-up access to the tool, but it was a way of um, audit trailing and recording updates to whatever the problem record was. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, you had to get up if you like and go sit there and go and look for an update, though often is how I felt about the process rather than receipt of an email, receipt of a phone call, there's an update in the problem record or things like that. But that might be my, my memory and just my recollection. And did you consider that the information on problems stored within it uh, at the time was adequate for your purposes as a problem manager? I'm going to have to say yes, but that is not based upon an awful lot of recollection. Um, I, I, you know, I can't think of any particular instance, for example, that would allow me to be more, more specific, but certainly the, you know, the basic intention was that the update would be provided um, for, and you know, if it wasn't appropriate, I certainly would have expected to have been challenging it and, and or escalating it. Was this another a point, though, when you were relying on Fujitsu's technical expertise? Oh, totally, yes. Yes. Please can we turn to page 12 of the same document? And under section 11.1... It refers to a uh, cross-domain problem management forum being held monthly prior to the service management forum and is intended to highlight and discuss all problems if time allows. Would you have attended that? No, I don't think I did, actually, because of the age of the document. I was relatively new within the team and, and junior, therefore. Um, some of the names on the front of the document I recognise. I, I noticed Stephen Potter's there, uh, name there, for example, he was a, a colleague of mine. He would have been much more likely. But I would have said, I, I do think it was Richard Ashcroft that was managing this team uh, at the time, and Bethany Newton, uh, that would have been there for him. The last sort of process I want to go over, which we I've been asked to go over with you, is the branch issue management process. Um, could we please turn up FUJ 000? Eight zero zero one five. 
so this describes the branch issue management process. Do, do you recall um, the role of the Fujitsu branch, branch issue management uh, process? On a very high level, um, I certainly remember many dealings with Nick Crow in particular. Uh, but for me, the difference for this role was it was meant to be much more proactive from Fujitsu's part in regards to actively going out and looking for issues. Again, I'm sure Nick would use lots and lots of uh, help desk data uh, to guide him and help him, but he would be very, very field-based in regards to his role. Network more than um, accounting discrepancies being what I remember, lots and lots of challenges with the various network methodologies that we used at the time, and Nick was an expert in that area and particularly assessing the geographic location, the branch environment, which could on occasions cause issues with the, with the connectivity. So uh, just to clarify that, when you say network rather than accounting, does it mean in your experience this process was more looking at, say, issues where a rural branch may not be able to connect to the servers uh, rather than a balancing discussion? I think it would. It, the scope would include both, but my recollection was that volume-wise would be much, much more challenging uh, and high numbers of, of network connectivity issues than accounting. Can we turn to page 12 of the document, please? And at the top, the proactive BIM process. Uh, it, it says the BIM is also responsible for analyzing trends and anomalies experienced at branch level. Yeah. The BIM will review the monthly statistics, i.e. the branch league tables, to identify exceptionally high instances of call numbers from branches or other possible indicators of potential issues. Uh, did you or anyone at post office have access to the branch league tables? Not that I recall. It might have been something we'd have done similar from an MBSE perspective. I don't actually remember having visibility of Fujitsu's branch league table. Um, that's not to say that I, I didn't, I just can't really remember. <coughs> Thank you. So th these sort of issues that, um, where there's the problem management, incident management, and, and this process, the, the BIM process, um, how did that work, or the problem management teams work, feed into the MBSC and the advice that the members of that team would provide? So, of course, all of the roles are supposed to interact and um, share knowledge, share information, update, as I mentioned earlier, knowledge articles, for example, ensure that uh, end users on the help desk were uh, appropriately informed of anything that was particularly uh, important out there at the moment, um, major incidents. Incident management was, for me, very much what it, what it sort of says on the tin. It was service restoration, handoff, root cause, problem management. Major BIM was very much more, as I say, proactive is how I thought about it. And, but Nick and the team, I feel, would interact with any uh, relevant section of the post office. Um, so if what Nick had found or was asked to investigate was a uh, accounting discrepancies, uh, for example, it's just as likely that he would have been involved with product and bench accounting within the post office as he would be the business service management function. But are you aware of a, a person within the post office who was to draw all of that information together to provide it to the MBSC to update the knowledge articles and things like that? No. No, I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, I, I think it would have fallen to each functional area to ensure that they were uh, informing the MBSC of, or advising the MBSC at a later stage of the benefits of a new new knowledge article or updating an existing. Was there a risk, um, or, or did you think there was a risk at the time that this knowledge wouldn't be passed on to the MBSC without a coordinated role? I, I, I think on reflection, yes, there would have definitely been a risk that um, some information may not have, may have been lost in translation or may not have been um, communicated or articulated in a, in a way that it meant to be, so it's entirely possible. Are you aware if the training for members of the MBSC was ever updated to take account of findings or information gleaned through the problem management process? I, I'm not. Post, 
post my time, um, I believe I'm correct in this, the MBSC was in effect outsourced, albeit to Royal Mail. Um, they were the owners of Dern House. They provided a range of contact centre uh, services to other clients of theirs um, and were perceived as contact centre experts. So um, once, once that was relinquished, if you like, as a service, they in effect became another supplier to the post office and I think they were managed accordingly. I can't comment on um, post office's contribution to training for those agents post that time. And when, uh, when do you, do you rec in your recollection, when was the, did that transfer occur? It would be a wild guess, I'm afraid, but I'm, I'm going to say around about, I think, 2006, six seven might be the time frame. The same questions, really, about these, these findings that problem management would, would make or, or incident uh, management would make. Uh, how were they, those findings, oh, so let me rephrase that, sorry. Was there one person who would be responsible for cascading that information to the people responsible for prosecuting sub postmasters? I don't know the name or whether they would, but I wouldn't have expected it to have been the individual problem managers. I would expect it to have been the leadership of that function. When you were a problem manager, were you ever approached by anyone uh, in the team responsible for prosecuting sub postmasters? to provide information on uh, potential problems in the Horizon IT system? I remember receiving um, requests to investigate and therefore engage Fujitsu, um, gather evidence potentially from the branch in regards to you know, trial balances, et cetera, transaction logs, uh, and relay that information. So I certainly remember having those on occasion. I do from perception believe that they were quite low in comparison to the other types of problems that we handled at the time. Um, but I don't then have any recollection, I'm afraid, at all about what happened post the conclusion of that problem, um, particularly if it was inconclusive, perhaps, rather than a very black and white response from Fujitsu that declared that the system had was working as per design and therefore there was no issue. Th those would go back to, I don't know who would send them, but they would go back to and be due to go back to the appropriate retail network manager. So you, you might have, um, your evidence is you, you might have a, or you remember uh, someone involved in prosecutions asking you about particular cases. Do you have any recollection of a more proactive approach of someone in the prosecution department saying, can you provide us information on, generally, on problems in the Horizon IT system? Not that I can remember, but, but all of those types of inquiries would come from internal, internal teams, and that, for me, from my recollection, was the retail network manager or the field intervention officers, I think some of them were called at a later date. So they would be the people out in the field um, who would have that day-to-day -day relationship and interaction with, with the branches, um, they may come to us for uh, to request Fujitsu support. Um, and in those examples, once with the conclusion of the investigation, it would go back from whence it came, so back to the retail network manager for consideration. Um, I think it's fair to say that if it wasn't the answer that we'd all hoped for in the sense that we'd found something that would explain whatever was occurring, that the retail network manager may have needed to then engage other parts of the business, again, including pr product and branch accounting, who you know naturally had visibility of um, the general accounting procedures, the records for every single branch in the network. Again, I apologize if I, I misheard this, but I, I asked about someone in the prosecution team asking you directly for that broader information. I think yep. you said no. You then pointed to the retail a network manager. Yes. I think, again, you gave an examples of when it would be specific cases um, that they would ask you about. Do you recall uh, the retail network managers ever asking you proactively and broadly about general problems in the Horizon IT system? Not proactively. It would be off the back of them being approached by a branch or them noticing a trend within a branch. 
I'd so say. sorry if I've understood that question. They would react to the knowledge and, and, and then becoming aware of a situation that they felt warranted further investigation. So that might be a, a suitable time to take a break. Uh, Let me just unmute myself to say yes. Excellent. So, uh, if we could say f five past um, three. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Um, we're, yep. we're just waiting for... Um, oh, yes. Uh, we're, we can progress now. Thank you. Mr Blackburn, I want to know... Um, we, we've talked about general matters. I want to now get into some of the specifics. And the first one is a major incident uh, on the 9th of May 2005. Please could I ask for poll 00091917 to be brought up. Uh, so this is the major incident report, and we can see in the external distribution list, um, which is at the bottom, that you, uh, um, you were included in this. Does that mean it's an incident that you would have dealt with, or was it just for information only? Um. No, it's quite possible that I would have played a major incident management role during the event itself. Do you recall this incident at all? I'm sorry, um, I don't. Um, unfortunately, there were quite a few from memory. Can we turn to page six, please? Uh, this says that the introduction says that the document details the initial incident that occurred within the live estate between 9 and 10 for a four minute period on Monday, 9th May 2005, and the activities that were carried out for the remainder of the business day by the appropriate POA service management and support teams. Uh, if we go to page eight now, please. Under the description of the fault, I'll read this for the record, it says the incident that occurred presently hasn't a determined root cause and occurred within the live estate whilst the SSC were analysing the correspondence server volume capacity using the repost volume command. The purpose of this activity was to ensure that there are, that there are available spare disk capacity across the correspondence server disk volumes. The work activity was carried out as a precautionary measure as a result of an archiving job not completing following an event storm that occurred the previous week. Uh, the repost volume um, command has been used on numerous occasions before with no impact to service, as it simply displays the details of repost volumes. Running this command stops repost services running for a microsecond and then starts, and brackets, unlocked. The service is again after the volume is taken. It is believed that in this instance, due to a bug in repost, the services did not start again. A peak, um, with the number there, has been raised with Escher development. Would you accept this appeared to be a significant problem in that uh, it's referring to a bug in the, in the repost code? Yes. And did this concern you at the time? Yes. And... Is it right that you, in your evidence that these types of incidents would not be, the, the outcomes of them would not be reported back to the branch network? I certainly wouldn't um, have reported them back to the branch network. Um, it's unlikely, I would have said, but I can't remember the particular event. Um, there may have often been other circumstances where it was a necessity uh, because you know we couldn't perhaps establish which branches were impacted to what degree, so we may have understood the impact, but not been able to identify it was branch A, B, and C, for example, and therefore you may have been on alert for waiting uh, 
for a call. And that's the kind of thing that we referred to earlier that might have generated a script um, on the Network Business Support Centre to capture that information and then make sure it's processed accordingly, i.e. a correction, if a correction was required, is applied. Um, but I'm sorry, I, I really don't remember the, the detail of, of, of this particular incident. Um, can we turn to paragraph 13? Sorry, page 13. My apologies. Under the table, the first three paragraphs refer to e-top-up e transaction failures, which presumably relates to mobile phone top-ups. Yes. Um, uh, displayed in the table above occurred due to the interface between Fujitsu and ePay. When authorised transaction timeout at the counter level, a reversal is automatically generated by the counter. Transactions were timing out due to the correspondence server problems on this day. ePay's systems have to match the reversal to the original authorization request. The reversal has to get to ePay within a time limit of 10 minutes. Uh, and then the paragraph, skip that paragraph, the next one is, because of the problems with the correspondence server replication on this day, a number of these reversals did not, not get through within the time limits. Um, is it, do you think because of that, because reversals not being able to be made, uh, that could have led to uh, discrepancies within accounts? Yes. And this would affect branches? Yes. But as I understand, if we now turn back to your witness statement, please, at paragraph five. So, um, page. Sorry, page three. Page three of your statement. In the middle, you, you're referring to a different incident, but say post-incident findings such as March 2005 were not shared with the branch network, to my knowledge. Um, yeah. So... You said you don't have knowledge of this being shared. Correct. Is there anyone else who would have been dealing with this at the time who might have shared it without your knowledge? Not, not directly, no. Um, I, I don't have any recollection of it being communicated. It's what I probably alluded to just a minute ago in regards to there had been um, a number of people, MBSC, HSH included, who would have been looking out for calls. I think... This is where product and branch accounting would have played a large role as well uh, in regards to observing the accounts that were being completed. Uh, they would have had the ability to focus in on e-top-up transactions as an example uh, and see whether there were discrepancies that I guess in theory could align with that event. Um, if a supposed master had a discrepancy when they came to balance, that may be because of a transaction that occurred some time before. Yes. Uh, and so when they come to balance, uh, some time has passed, and it might be that a supposed master simply accepts a discrepancy as an error. Uh, always been a problem, yes. I think um, often the value would be a trigger. Um, large values, you know, go would likely be reported low values, may well have just been accepted without the knowledge, yes. And what was what's the justification for the general policy that um, incidents such as this wouldn't have been shared with the branch network so that the SBMs could be aware of potential errors in the system? I couldn't comment on what the policy was or, or the reasoning beyond, you know, operational role for me, restore service, um, and the belief uh, that there were no issues that were generated with the solution. Clearly, this was a major incident, not necessarily software-related uh, per se. It was something unintended that occurred that generated a discrepancy. I'd have expected product and branch accounting to have um, cleaned up this particular situation, but so can't, can't say categorically that was what occurred. So the, is it your evidence that the communication, the responsibility for the communication lay elsewhere? It, it, exactly that, yes. Um, 
I want to now look at what's been called the calendar square blog. Please can we turn to poll 3028984 and page 10. At the bottom, there's an email from Sandra McKay. Uh, do, do you remember who she was? I'm sorry, no, I don't. The subject is Calendar Square, which was a sub-post office. And the first line says, uh, it's, this is to Sean Turn, I should say, sorry. You may recall that in September, the above office had major problems with their horizon system relating to transfers between stock units. If we go over the page... Uh, the SPMR has reported that he is again experiencing problems with transfers, which resulted in a loss of around £43,000, um, which has subsequently rectified itself. I know that the SPMR has reported this to Horizon Support, who have come back to him stating they cannot find any problem. Uh, Firstly, did you have any dealings with the Calendar Square branch uh, in September? No, my, my dealing with this branch was triggered by Sean Turner reaching out to me. We'll, we'll get to that in, in a moment. Could we go to page 10, please? Just to follow the trail, we, have San, we had Sandra McKay's email at the bottom. Uh, we then have an email... Uh, to Sean Turner from Brian Trotter. Uh, do you remember who Brian Trotter was? I'm going to say retail network management, but I, I couldn't tell you specific. Oh, it's the contract and service manager there, isn't he? But, uh, yes, I do recognise the name. It says, he, um, I visited the branch with Sandra last week, and the SPMR provided clear documented evidence that something very wrong is occurring with some of the processes when carrying out transfers between stock units. And if we go over the page to page nine, we see what you just referred to as your um, involvement. And it's an email from Sean Turner, um, dated 6th of January 2006. He asked for your advice on this branch. Uh, why would Sean Turner have come to you for this particular issue? Uh, purely the interaction and relationship with Fujitsu. So we were an escalation team. We weren't outwardly facing to, to branches. We were a, a level two, if you, if you like. Um, and the retail network management, all of them, had the opportunity to raise escalations with us for us to engage Fujitsu and, and get them to investigate a particular occurrence. And that's what happened on this occasion. And in, indeed, at the bottom, he, he describes a problem, and his last sentence is, I am concerned that there is a fundamental flaw with the branch's configuration and would be interested to know how Fujitsu Services put the first issue to bed. Um, at this point in time, did you think this was an issue that was affecting a single branch or a wider issue? Single. If we... Um, go up the page, I think it's to the next page, we'll see you email Liz Evans-Jones. Do you remember who she was? Yeah, she was um, um, a higher level than me. In effect, she was my line manager's opposite. So I went straight to um, an escalated level within Fujitsu rather than go to the people I would ordinarily engage with. And why, why did you decide to escalate it? Sean was somebody who I got the greatest respect for and trust for. I'd known him a very long time. His email was casting enough concern for me to choose to do that on this occasion. I, the £43,000 discrepancy, is that, that's a, a large um, discrepancy? Yes. I, I mean, obviously, it is ridiculously large. Um, having said that, you know, numbers are everywhere in, in the post office, and so it, it isn't necessarily a trigger. It was, it was really the fact that Sean was coming to me. Number one, he was escalating to me, which meant it was important. And number two, um, um, it just looked like something um, on the basis of his knowledge, his experience, that he was saying the system not work as it was intended. So I went straight to an escalated level on that occasion. Liz Evans-Jones' response is 
immediately above this. Yeah. Um, and she says, I've checked the call, and this issue is scheduled to be resolved in S90. What, what was your understanding of S90 at that point? Um, a new software release that the business was working on. Um, it would have contained many things. I'm assuming lots of business-related reasons for a new software release, but it would have also contained uh, a backlog of uh, fixes for any bugs or defects that had been found. I, c I couldn't say on what, over what time frame, um, but for me, I do remember S90 being very important. I do seem to remember a lot of communication about its need um, being rolled out to the branch network. Um, at page seven, if we could go up, you, we see that you pass this on to Sean Turner. And then Sean Turner g goes on to reply to you. Yes. We carry on up. Thank you. Um, and this is the 17th of February now. And the first question, Sean Turner asks three questions, the first of which says, do we understand why this particular branch has been having problems, or are there other branches in the network that have uh, that have been having this problem? Now, at this stage, had your view changed on, from it being a single branch issue to um, having concerns with it being a wider issue, or not? It wasn't actually no. Um, so, whilst I'd taken from Liz Melrose Jones' response that clearly Fujitsu were aware of it and or a risk of it. This was my first experience of it actually occurring within the network. So at this point in time, clearly I was aware now that there was a risk of others being impacted, but this was the only <coughs> branch specifically that I was aware of. Uh, if you look at page three on this email uh, chain, Now we see it on the 23rd of February, 2006, there's an email from Anne Chambers to um, Mike Stewart, which you, you were subsequently sent this email. Yes. And you would have read it at the time. Yes. And the second paragraph says, haven't looked at the recent evidence, but I know in the past this site had hit this repost lock problem two or three times within a few weeks. This problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks. And finally, I should say, they have done something about it. What did this mean to you when you read it? Um, news. It's, it's not something, you know, I do actually, when, when I've looked at all the evidence you've provided, whilst I couldn't remember the detail until I went back through the uh, evidence. Calendar Square was a name and a post office that I remembered immediately because this was long running from my involvement. Um, but that, to me, that statement was, um, I believe at the time, news to me, not something that I was aware of, that branches could have this issue from smart post transactional problems. Uh, were this problem concerned transfers from stock units, um, Calendar Square? Um, I'd, under, I'd understood it was triggered, yes, but I thought I'd understood it was triggered by a particular transaction. I may be mis uh, incorrect on that. But in terms of the problem itself, the, say, the fact that it's saying um, it's been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks, that's, do you believe that, that was significant? It's shocking, yes, shocking, if, uh, especially on the basis of, as you could see from Liz's response, that if there was an awareness of it... <laughs> There wasn't enough awareness of it. Um, and uh, it had been parked, obviously, for quite a while in the backlog if we were only going to look to fix it in the S90 software release. Did you have any concerns at the fact that when we went, the first email we went to, um, Calendar Square Branch were initially told that there was no problem in the system? I wouldn't say concerned until you get, you know, you get the rest of the detail and then you understand and then you can reflect back and go, yes, you would be concerned. I think it points to my earlier point around having to trust, you know, the expertise in terms of um, the advice and guidance that have been given. 
Um, but again, I'll also say this was my first awareness of this particular problem and this particular branch experience in this problem. Um, what had gone before, I, I couldn't say whether that was just calls logged into the Horizon Service Desk and how those had been resolved and managed. The last paragraph say, of this email uh, says, please note that Kells tell SMC that they must contact sites and warn them of balancing problems if they notice the event storms caused by the held lock mm. and advise them to reboot the affected counter before continuing with the balance. Unfortunately, in practice, it seems to take SMC several hours to notice these storms, uh, by which time the damage may have been done. Do you know what th this refers to when it's talking about event storms, or wh what was your understanding at the time? At the time, that would have been, as I uh, just said, my first reading of it. Um, I don't really, it'd be a question for Fujitsu, I'm afraid, as to what an event storm a actually is or contains. But it clearly shows that Fujitsu were aware of it. They'd created a known error log and were managing the calls, um, at least reactively. But I don't equally remember any proactive communication on the, um, from when this was originally identified. Did you discuss this issue with uh, anyone within post office once it came to your attention? No, but I think not long after this particular email, I think more evidence became available to me. I think three or four, maybe five post offices having the same problem for the same reasons. Um, at that point, I had made sure that it was escalated into our problem management function to get greater visibility and awareness. Um, prior to that additional set of branches, though, I, I'll be honest and say that I'd accepted Liz's position and that S90 was the fix. Was anyone, with any of the conversations you'd had with anyone in post office about this, were you, did, were you aware of anyone in post office who was aware of this problem <laughs> before? I, I, no, I personally no. I, I'd find it hard to sit here and believe that no one did know. Um, but personally, no, I didn't know. Uh, what, um, what steps were taken uh, in respect of communicating this uh, issue or this bug to teams outside of problem management? I don't recall, I'm afraid. I, what I can say is I didn't communicate it further than problem management. What happened to it beyond then, I'm sorry, I couldn't say. I can't remember. Do you know who was responsible for communicating that outside of problem management? Someone somewhere in the business at, at a reasonable level would have had to have make, made a decision as to whether it was um, communicated in its entirety and a warning provided to branches aligned with that Fujitsu knowledge article, for example, where, which seems to be sat, as I'm saying, reactively waiting for a storm to occur and then a response. Um, I'm not sure, though, that a branch would have had the ability to have noticed or known what a storm was or, or looked like or felt like, so that you know, may have been the most appropriate response. Are, are you... So, so we, we, you say you, you passed it on to um, the knowledge, uh, sorry, problem management team. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of this issue being known about by other members of the post office outside of that knowledge management team? No, as I say, it was news to me. So, um, I, so after you discovered it, after I discovered it, no, I don't know whether they, you know, I can't remember what or who they communicated with post raising of the problem record. But I would suspect, given that clearly there was already awareness of it within Fujitsu and a fix queued to go out within S90, that the process that's described in there just continued up to rollout of S90. Do you think that um, sub postmaster should have been made aware of this? issue? Ideally, yes. 
as I say, I think the trigger is worrying me somewhat because I don't have an understanding of what event storm means or whether it would be obvious to somebody at the at the branch counter end. But ideally, I think, you know, as a basic principle, um, all branches should have been aware of any particular defects or issues that could have affected accounting. Were you involved with the... Um handling the problem after initially discovering it? I don't think I was actually, no. Did it influence the way you thought about the Horizon IT system thereafter? I, I, th I think not only this, but at that time others were now already more prevalent, um, probably for any number of reasons, just you know, knowledge, understanding the, the, the way that people were then more confident in reporting and reported them through the procedures, there were certainly um, an upward trend in regards to any number of instances where people believed Horizon may have caused the discrepancy. I want to move on to a different issue. Um, please can we open FUJ 20121072. This is an email uh, to you from Gareth Jenkins. Uh, did you did you work with Gareth Jenkins often? No, uh, Gareth was um, sort of development level, from what I remember, deeply technical. It was a, a rarity for Gareth to reach out uh, to me, particularly if he's copied in Mike Stewart, who would be much more likely my uh, point of contact uh, occasionally, Anne. So the, the date is in the American form, but it, it's the, sent on the 13th of February 2007, yeah. uh, and it attaches a document called REM Misbalance. If we could look at that now, it's FUJ 20121073. Do you recall receiving this document at the time? I don't recall. No, sorry. Uh, it describes a serious bug introduced into live that can result in accounts misbalancing. Uh, this bug was introduced as part of LFS counter 356, which went to a limited number of branch branches for a pilot from 4th of the 2nd, 2007 to 11th of the 2nd, 2007, uh, and then to the whole estate on 12th February 2007. And it goes on to describe the, um, the history of the issue. If we could go down, please. So the, the basic problem affects. So the basic problem is that when REM outs, could you help us with what REM outs are? Um, sending out remittances probably of cash rather than stock back into the post office area, so back to cash centres or back to the Swindon Stock Centre. Um, so it's an incorrect... Surplus. Oh, sorry. Sorry, surplus. So the incorrect transactions are recorded. Specifically, some of the REM transactions are missing. Take, for example, two £500 coin bags being remitted out, then the following was recorded. And if we look at that table, effectively it's showing um, the, the cash out um, on the top line, the REM out cash is 500 when it should be 1,000. Yeah. And it says below, the stock unit will show a 500 pound excess cash and a receipts and payments mismatch. If we can go over the page, please. Thank you. So some bra branches have made a further REM of 500 pounds in an attempt to correct the situation if this pouch is subsequently dispatched, then this should result in the branch accounts being correct. But note that this results in further incorrect data being sent to Post Office Limited um, FSC discussion in section 3.2. However, if this pouch is, not, pouch is not dispatched, then the stock unit will balance and report correctly, but the 500 pounds will remain stuck in suspense. 
goes on to say, it is re recommended that all branches are advised to do such a dummy rem and to dispatch the pouch so as to ensure that the branch accounts are clear. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just, in broad terms, explain what that advice is, the, the dummy rem? Uh, creation of um, a false rem, a remittance amount, to uh, trigger the, the, the balance accounting being accurate, but it's something that it doesn't exist in terms of, I think, the example, £500. So, in effect, redo the transaction without yeah. sending the cash so it balances. Correct. It. And it says it has been agreed that POA SSC, so the SSC, will contact each branch with detailed advice as to exactly what to do. Uh, please, can we now go to the technical appendix of the Horizon Issues Judgment? It's um, Paul 302841 on page 52. So this is the judgment of Mr Justice Fraser uh, in the group litigation order where uh, the judge was looking at bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon IT system uh, from which this inquiry is building on the findings. Okay. And section six refers to a reming out bug. If we could go over the page to 201, please. It says... Issue 6.1 arises as follows. What is called a reming, out, a reming error leads to a mismatch between the amounts of cash remmed out to one place and the amounts remmed in from another. The post office has sub submitted that remmed error is a, a clear violation of data entry accounting and picked up by Horizon. The two different issues are as follows. It says, as, as the obverse of the coin of reming in, SPM's rem out pouches of cash to be returned to the post office cash centre. A single pouch may contain multiple bags of coins or cash, and each bag can only hold one denomination, and there is a limit on how much cash can be placed into each, a pouch. A cash can be remmed out before it is physically collected. When remmed out, the cash appears in a different line in the branch accounts. On collection, the collection team scan a barcode on the pouch and the cash is removed from the cash in the pouches line of the accounts. And it said, when reming out, branches should have made one entry for each denomination and value. And if there were multiple bags for a particular denomination, the quantity of bags should have been specified in that single entry, so two times 500 uh, pounds of two pound coins. However, if the SPMs uh, had made multiple entries in, for each denomination and value for one entry for one 500 pound bag of two pound coins and a second entry for one 500 bag of two pound coins, Horizon would only record the first bag as having left the branch's cash holdings, but all of the bags would show on the cash in pouches line. This would have created a, a discrepancy in the branch accounts because all of the cash would have been collected. Um, is this the bug that um, you were dealing with with Gareth Jenkins on in February? I can't be absolutely certain, but it certainly uh, reads and appears to be, yes. So in essence, the problem in, in lay terms is uh, two caches, two pouches, say, are £500 a cent to the cash centre, uh, but Horizon only logs that one has been sent. Yes. And so Horizon records that there is an additional £500 which isn't actually there. Correct. Can we please go to FUJ 00120587? This is um, a known error log, KEL ACHA 508S. Uh, and you see it's created on the 12th of February 2007, or raised then, so at the time this was made, this issue was being dealt with, and last updated on 15th of February 2007. And we see from the symptoms uh, that we are referring here to this, um, mm -hmm. this bug. Yes. Please could we go down to the bottom section? 
It says calls about inconsistencies in stock rem out should be redirected to MBSC. SSC have contacted all branches who have had a problem with cash rem outs, quoting ref PC143435. So is it the position then at this stage on the 15th of February, um, the SSC had called the branches or contacted the branches where there was a discrepancy arising from this bug uh, and sought to deal with it? That's how I'm reading that, yes, that they've called the ones that have been identified. Please can we turn now to FUJ 00121071 uh, and turn to page three at the very bottom. see your, your name at the bottom, uh, Yes. an email on the 15th of February. And if we can go over the page to see the content of that email. And the subject is T30 release, impact on stock REMS, Monday 12th February. You say, scenario, whilst the T30 release was out in the branch network, Monday 12th February, uh, only for all bar only for all bar 120 branches that were in communicado during the initial regression process. We have a potential situation where a branch completing a stock rem out, so that's the, the cash going out to the cash centre, on that day could have a discrepancy due to the fact that not all stock physically returned by the branch may have been deducted from Horizon from the stock on hand table. This despite the fact that the rem slip produced matched the physical stock returned. Mm -hmm. Um, you then say, the under latest position, we have a possible 570 branches that were affected by last weekend's T30 release, now regressed. The pouch IDs have been identified by Fujitsu. The branches who sent those pouches have be also been identified, and the value of the stock returned from each has been established from the POC file. Do you know what the POC file is? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Oh. We still don't know which of these branches has actually got a discrepancy due to the problem. So these are potentially affected branches unknown if Un there's a yes. discrepancy. In terms of next steps, you say, Ident identify which of those branches have a discrepancy between Horizon and the REM slip. Options here are to contact the branches or wait and react to calls made into MBSC HSD. I will then arrange a conference call to discuss way forward tomorrow. So um, is it fair to say that these 570 branches are different to the branches the SSC had already contacted uh, in the KEL we'd referred to? I can't actually remember, but that's the way I am reading this, yes, that they're additional. And res in respect of these branches, you, there's, there's essentially two options, is it fair? One, one is a proactive approach of contacting those branches to advise them of the issue. Yes. And the second is to wait for calls to come into the MBSC. Do you accept that? Yes. Thank you. Now, at this stage, the sub-postmasters, again, would have no idea that there was a bug in the system, would they? Correct. And a sub-postmaster would only be aware of the issue in balancing when they came to balance the stock unit. Correct. And again, this could be sometime after reming out. It could. So again, it's another example of when a sub-postmaster may have thought that discrepancy on balancing was caused by a mistake. Yes. And they had no reason to believe, if they're not told, that it was due to a bug, error or defect in the Horizon IT system. That's also correct. Please, can we go to page three? Uh, it's, it's quite confusing the way this email is set out, but you see halfway down there's an email from Dave Holbert, um, 5th of February 2007, yep. uh, forwarding on your email um, to Andy McLean, just starting out with some identities. Uh, who was Dave Holbert? My line manager at the time. And Andy McLean? 
Here's line manager. As Andy, see update below. Not much progress today. The dilemma for Gary is approaching branches is proactive, um, but opens the risk of litigation in future, i.e. we're telling 570 branches that Horizon may have caused the discrepancy. Low risk, but our risk. Being reactive doesn't feel right as we've caused a problem for branches, but this may be the right option in the situation. To what extent was the risk of litigation taken into account at the post office at this time when deciding how to handle a known bug, error, or defect? Uh, it's possibly more of a question for David and Andy. My reason for escalating this, obviously beyond the seriousness of the situation, is just a growing awareness of the volume of uh, defect or bug-related calls and inquiries that we were undertaking. Um, but also very aware um, that the mantra and message was still, there are no horizon integrity issues um, and there are no systemic issues that cause problems. And yet, here's clearly an example, whether driven by human error or not, um, that, that was creating discrepancies in branch. But in this case, it's right to say in this case, there was a known error. There was, an, an, in this instance, a known error, yes. That caused discrepancies. Yes. And your line manager uh, is, is suggesting here of not taking a proactive approach, and one of the reasons given is the risk of litigation. Yes. And the risk of that litigation, um, uh, presumably, is that someone will turn around and say, Horizon is causing discrepancies. Absolutely. Which, in fact, it was in this case. It was. And what did you think to this email when you saw it? It's difficult because now I'm in a position many years later where I'm reflecting on it, of course, with the benefit of hindsight. But it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable reading today, and it was uncomfortable reading then. Was this reflective... Um, of a broader culture in the post office at the time that, lit that um, the horizon shouldn't be challenged? Uh, it's, I don't want to repeat going back to the messages, but absolutely on the basis that there was no accepted agreement, that there was horizon integrity issues, that was the general culture, uh, and that is what drove the behaviour. Please can we turn to page two of this email? Uh, at the bottom, you uh, email, I think it looks like you, you emailed Dave Hulbert and Andy McLean. Yes. Uh, and you say, bad news. On further investigation today, we have established that the POC file actually matches uh, POLFS. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it, it meant that we still didn't and couldn't identify the values or the branches involved in this particular issue. This means that we don't, we still don't know what value stock has been returned by these 570 branches. Furthermore, the only way we could find out would be for someone at Swindon to find the specific pouches and physically open each one and count the stock. This rules out a proactive recovery plan. Do you still agree with that? It ruled it out in the sense that what would we have told the branch? We could have told them there was a problem, but nothing more. Couldn't give them any indication of to the extent of impact that it had had on them. Um, but actually, with hindsight, there would have been an opportunity to, I think, have, well, I can see that throughout the email chain that product and branch accounting have been included within this because they would have been seeing um, as well the outcome and the impact of this. <laughs> there was clearly an opportunity to have reached out to the 570 branches, even in the absence of detail uh, and values, and informed them so that they were aware, so that we could have done something more collaborative with them to resolve the issue. 
And you go on to say that I've ensured that both MBSC and HSD have scripts to deal with any queries relating to stock from these branches. So that's if someone rings in. That's that reactive process again and that script again to make sure that they're captured and then that the branch um, is recompensed and the correction made. Uh, the inquiry hasn't seen or had sight of that script. Uh, do you know where those scripts would usually be held or stored? Was it on the remedy system as well? Uh, given the temporary nature, I'm not sure whether they were uploaded digitally or, or not actually. But if they were anywhere, it would be Network Business Support Centre environment. Um, if we can move on to a an, another issue, please, and that's uh, a, a peak that you refer to in your witness statement. It's POL 0001313. So, um, before the inquiry sent you a document like this, had you seen it, one of these before, a PEAK? Um, yes, occasionally. I can't remember what the PEAK acronym sort of means, but I think it relates to Fujitsu's internal tool or system for recording bugs and defects that needed to be queued in a backlog then for fix. Um, if there was any reason for... Um, somebody like Anne Chambers, I think it is Anne in this instance, isn't it, to, to make me aware of that. Um, I suspect it probably was attached to the email explaining to me, hopefully in simple terms, um, why I was being informed. Um, and this says uh, issue at branch 106129, uh, which has a, a non-zero trading position. And the entry on the 18th of February at um, 1,500 hours, just go down slightly, sorry. Yeah, branch 10629 appears to be affected by a known software problem, which causes a non-zero trading position, a receipts and payments mismatch, and an incorrect discrepancy. And further down at on the 25th of February, we see that um, you were notified of this problem. Do you have any independent recollection of that? I'm afraid not, no. Over the page, uh, on, again on the 25th of February, um, it says, thanks, Anne. Final BIMs issued to Paul, uh, including information for BIMs text, returning call to EDSC for closure. Um, can you just assist with what that means in terms of the final BIMs issued to Paul? Not an expert, I'm afraid, on the uh, issues management process, but I think that this would have been communicated to product and branch accounting. Um, it's not something that they'd have been looking for support from incident management with. And I'm afraid I have no recollection at all what the acronym EDSC means. We'll leave that there then and move on to another matter. Um, Paul 302765, please. This is a, a peak PC 0152014, uh, branch 183227. Uh, it refers to an incomplete summaries report. Uh, can we go to the bottom of uh, page one, please? We see there's an entry on the 10th of December, right, uh, right at the bottom. Yes. Um, if we could go over the page... This is due to a single SC line written for $1,000, uh, £484, with no settlement in the middle of two RISP transactions. Um, 
it says on call PC 0151718, the harvester exception was corrected, and now the transaction for the day, transaction for the day don't zero, hence this issue with the incomplete summaries form. Um, and goes on to refer to requesting the message form. Uh, do, you un do you understand broadly what this problem was? Is I, I don't, it's too technical for me, but fundamentally it's, it's describing another um, software-related, application-related issue that's created a discrepancy in the branch. It refers to OCP 17510, which has been raised. Do you remember what an OCP was? Um, operational change process or procedure or something like that, I think. It was the audit trail that was created to match with whatever action was being taken. So that that 17510 should match a whatever correction activity, so whether that's message store or otherwise, was done to, to, to make this right. So when you say message store, do you mean where Fujitsu were making change? Where Fujitsu went into the system to correct the, the issue. And the OCP was the... And the OCP the was the audit trail for that activity. Um, do you recall what, well, from your recollection, what were the controls, the security controls on the use of OCP? Uh, I don't. I mean, I would have seen plenty in my time for both awareness and on occasions approval, um, but I don't really mem remember, I'm afraid, the process, how we raised them, how they were triggered. I think we just had a re an approval or sight of uh, within my team. Uh, can we look at the um, the OCP? It, it's uh, FUJ 3087194. Uh, so we see right corrective bureau message um, for the branch. It says a single SC message was written in error on 26th November, selling $1,000 with no corresponding settlement line yeah. to remove the effects of this message at both the branch and on POLFS. We will insert a new message to negate the effects of the original message. So is your understanding of this that what um, Fujitsu would do is insert a, essentially a transaction into the branch accounts? To, to balance the books, yes, and, uh, and accepted process as well. I know this is just one example, but that would be what I'd expect to happen in these circumstances. When were you first aware of Fujitsu's ability to <sighs> insert I, transactions like this? I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to say probably HNGX rather than Legacy Horizon so much later on. Um, well, we're, we're here in, we're in 2007. Uh, oh, right. The rise okay. online is 2010 so, onwards. So. Yeah, so, I, but I still, I'm afraid I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not something that you were particularly conscious of at the time or that it maybe particularly concerned you or felt, um, felt wrong in any kind of way. If I, I, I can't find a way to articulate it, it felt part of a BAU process. From, a, from an internal operational perspective. Were you aware of any ability of Fujitsu to insert, edit or delete transactions from the branch accounts outside of the OCP procedure? Oh, no. I'd have, I'd have always expected there to have been communication with post office, and if it was making a correction, OCP was... Um, I was going to say the only, there may have been another but th that was a process for audit trailing amendments that were being made. Uh, if we can uh, go down to the bottom of this OCP, um, sorry, did, uh, not, not that far, sorry, just a, a little further up. Thank you. Um, we refer to extra detail and it, and it gives the uh, original message and the new message attributes. Do, do those, I mean, 
from your position, you say, you say you're non-technical. Do those um, words mean anything to you insofar as can, could you challenge them or, or check they're accurate? No. You know, it's, we w I would always work, my team would always work based upon the business outcome element of the, any given situation. So for me, really simply, uh, this is about rectifying correctly for a branch a situation which is not of their making. Uh, and so it says at the bottom there, Gary Blackburn, POL, is, is already aware of this issue. Yes. Um, and if we go down, there's an email which you, you aren't in copy for, but it says, Hi, Gabby. Paul, have Paul approved this change. As soon as I saw the branch name, I realised that this was one that uh, Gary spoke to Anne Chambers about earlier. Um, so at this time, were you effect you were relying on Fujitsu to implement the uh, the change, and no one at post office was checking it from a technical perspective. Not not from my perspective, and as I've said, I I and my team, of which Julie Edgley was one at the time, would not have had that ability. So it's going on the advice, the guidance given. Would you have told the or arranged for the sub postmaster to be told of this change? Uh, I don't remember doing so. I really would like to sit here today and be able to say to you that we did. It is possible that we did. Uh, we spoke to, you know, I and I, through all my years, spoke to many supposed masters, but I really cannot say that I did on this occasion. On, on gen, in general terms, when in, you had these types of transactions, would in you... In general terms... Yes, naturally, we would want to ensure that the postmaster was aware because there was a, an, an issue of awareness and timing of because it would become apparent to them because an entry was being made. I think there might be a different example within the pack where we have, we've actually recorded an email that we, we spoke to a particular postmaster, but I can't remember this particular example. If we could go uh, back to the peak we looked at before, please. It's uh, three zeros two seven, sorry, two three seven six five, and to page three. On the 14th of December, the entry at 1537 says, email to Gary Blackburn. Um, the inquiry doesn't have or hasn't had sight of that email. But the, the following entry uh, says this. Uh, the, the counter problem which caused the first issue has been corrected by inserting a message into the message store for equal but opposite values, quantities, as agreed with Paul, OCP 17510, which was the document we just went yes. to. Yes. As a result of this corrective action, the net effect on POLFS is zero, and the POLFS figures are in line with the branch. Paul misreceived both the original message and the corrective message. Once the problem was corrected, there should have been no impact on the branch. However, it has been noted that the stock unit, BDC, has a loss of $1,000, which was generated after the correction was made. We have already notified Gary Blackburn at Poll, email attached. This appears to be a genuine loss at the branch, not a consequence of the problem or correction. Uh, do you recall being made aware of this? Um, I don't, but clearly I was. Is it a fair summary to say what... what and Chambers effectively is saying here is there was initially a problem uh, which caused a thousand dollar discrepancy. Yeah. They um, inserted a transaction to try to correct that, so a thousand uh, dollar transaction the other way, and now there was a thousand dollar loss to the branch, which they were saying uh, was unrelated to the use of the remote access. Does that strike you as odd? Yes. Um, w there's no record of this being, uh, in, in this peak, of this being challenged at the time. Do you think you would have challenged it? I'd like to think so, but again, you know, passage of time, I, I honestly, it, it isn't something that I remember, but, you know, 
clearly a thousand dollars is a trigger there to say too much of a coincidence. It's correct, isn't it, that under the um, the way a post office interpreted the con its contract with Sub Postmaster at the time, that um, a discrepancy for which there wasn't a system explanation, uh, the Sub Postmaster would have been expected to, to make good that discrepancy. That, that would be my understanding, yes. So as a matter, matter of basic fairness, do you accept they should have been told about uh, the fact that a transaction I won't use that term, sorry. The fact that remote access had been used to insert a transaction. Yes. But again, there's no record of, um, in this peak of that, the suppose must have been and, told. And I can't remember, I'm afraid, whether it was or it wasn't. Um, before moving on, can we turn to page 12, please, of your witness statement, paragraph 23? Um, deal here with remote access and you refer to the OCP proce procedure, you say, I also knew that they, 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 being Fujitsu, could see what had happened in branch down to the detailed sequence of individual keystrokes. So is, is your evidence that Fujitsu held audit data that showed what keystrokes had been used in branch? Um, yes, that was my understanding. Yes. And how often did you request such um, such data or to see such data? Um, possibly once or twice with post officers that were in this kind of scenario. I'm not saying the same particular trigger, but were disputing discrepancies. Um, I do remember it was actually through the BIM process, through Nick Crow, that, that it had been requested to try and prove or disprove a sequence of events that might have explained whether it was system-driven or user-driven. And uh, so you say you use it to... to, was it to, to I think a couple of occasions, only a couple of occasions, where there was really quite difficult, protracted uh, inquiries and investigations. I'm sorry, I can't remember the names of the post officers. I remember one was in Exeter, is all I can say. Uh, was it difficult to obtain that information? Yes. Why? It wasn't just it's something I had to, you know, you'd have to ask for. Um, and and um, it may have been on occasions that, you know, it wasn't available for whatever reason. It's a question for Fujitsu to, to understand how they audited and retained uh, and held that information. Um, but no, it wasn't something that I could just freely um, obtain. Uh, and did you have to get internal approval to seek such information? Um, I don't remember doing so. I remember it just feeling that if it was the right one of the right questions to ask in a circumstance, that we would we would we would ask. Were you aware of any costs implications of obtaining such data? I wasn't. No. Uh, and are you aware of any whistleblowing policies um, in post office at the time relating to um, issues such as remote access or bugs, errors, and defects? No. I'm sorry. So I'm just looking at time. I've still got um, a few topics to cover, uh, and there are questions from uh, core participants as well. I understand Mr. Blackburn is available to, tomorrow to give evidence. I've come prepared, yes. Um, I'm happy to carry on, but I... I... Are, you, are you saying um, collectively that we would go substantially beyond 4.30 if we tried to finish him today? Uh, I'll just check. How, how long do people think they will be with questions so as matters stand I don't have anything um, at the moment I've only got short questions in which case so I I'd, I'd understood that oh, sorry there's no no questions but no in which case I'd understood there would be many more questions uh, and so I, I think I can fit it in in that time yeah I, I'm reasonably happy to go until about 445 thereafter I have to say my concentration levels will start to waver, but um, I, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Blackburn would prefer to finish if he could tonight. I would. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, so I'm sorry, I have been asked if we could take a five minute break um, for the yeah, purpose of the transfer. I'll I, I tell you what, let's take five minutes and then everybody can sharpen themselves to try and finish by 4.45. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, good. Sir, can you see and hear me? I can. Good. Thank you. I'll, I'll carry on. Mr Blackburn, I, before moving on to the next topic, I failed to put something to you earlier, which I should do now. So apologies for treading over ground we've covered. Could we go back to FUJ 00121071? And this was about the Reming Out bug we discussed earlier. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at page three, we discussed about the uh, ruling out a proactive recovery plan uh, and also a um, so relying on a reactive one I, I feel I should put it to you squarely from this is it fair to say that a reactive recovery plan was in fact followed in this case yes thank you if we could uh, move then to cover uh, a dispute arising from the Hogsthorpe Post Office uh, and that is if we could turn to poll 00021163 please and page four Thank you. Uh, so at the, at the bottom, please, we see that this refers to the uh, Hogsthorpe Post Office, who at the time was uh, operated by David Hedges, who's, who's uh, likes to be known as Tom Hedges. Um, Mr. Hedges is a core participant in this inquiry who has provided a witness statement. Uh, and this is an email from Karen Arnold. Uh, do you recall who she was? I'm going to say the generic term again, retail network management arena. Yep. It says, further to our conversation last week regarding the losses at Hogsthorpe, uh, the SPMR, David Hedges, uh, who likes to be known as Tom, has contacted the MBSC to establish what the BAU, is that business as usual? Yes. BAU slash correct process is for suspending a session of SmartPost. Uh, can you assist us with what SmartPost is? Um, only it was a transaction at the time. I can't remember what um, specifically, but it was a posting transaction. As Tom tells me that the MBSC said it was okay to use either of the methods he describes. As a reminder, I've copied information below in respect of what described to me last week. Um, that is over the page. We don't need to um, look at that in, in any detail. If we could have on the screen at the same time, please, um, paragraph 21 of your witness statement on page 11. And on the actual uh, document, the POL 00021163, um, if, if we could go to uh, page five, please. Uh, so if, uh, if you go be below that for the time being. There, thank you, thank you. Your response on the 7th of July was to, um, was to say that Fujitsu uh, would not check a replace processor automatically, but I don't believe that would add, add any value in this instance. As we discussed last week, the most likely explanation was slash is user error, but given the calls into MBSC and HSD, we should assume that this is not the root cause at this time. Uh, in your witness statement at paragraph 21, you say, when, when Karen Arnold first contacted me, my initial response 
uh, comes from my preempting the most likely root cause of the problem being within branch, which was purely based upon the fact that at the time I had no understanding or even belief that the Horizon application could or did generate erroneous discrepancies linked to this transaction type. Now, when you say that, are you saying transaction type is in smart post? Yes. So you, meant you were aware of the ability of Horizon to create discrepancies? The general, as we've discussed, yes. I was particularly, hence I chose my words quite carefully there. It was smart post specifically. Um, thank you. We can take down the witness statements um, then for the time being. Why did you think user error was the most likely explanation, even though you had seen um, evidence of bugs, errors and defects in Horizon in other areas? It, it's, I think, an example, looking back, of just how, how we all thought, behaved, believed, worked within the processes that and that's despite, and I know that sounds incredibly silly to say that um, at the end of this review, but that is how we believed. If there had to be evidence to support Horizon creating discrepancies, so in the absence of the general stance, rightly or wrongly, was that it was more likely to be user error interacting with the service uh, and completing the tra transaction incorrectly. Uh, please could we uh, bring that document back up? It's, so it's POL 30 uh, and I, th I think it was page four. Um, Yes, um, the, the bottom paragraph of your email, you say, if Tom has specific information such as transaction time and values, please send this across and I will get Fujitsu to investigate immediately. If has no evidence, then I'm afraid there is nothing for Fujitsu to investigate. Um, what evidence could uh, Mr. Hedges have provided which Fujitsu or the post office didn't have access to? Um. I think ultimately it would have been the accounting, the transaction logs, um, the trial and or final balances. But it's right that, that that would have all been available to Fujitsu, correct? So for, what was the reason for asking Mr Hedges for this? I, I, I can't recollect, but I think it comes from my previous statement about uh, in the absence of, uh, we, you know, it wasn't automatically uh, taken forward. Please, could we um, look at page three now? Uh, so Karen uh, Arnold replies saying, I'm not sure why Fujitsu would be changing the processor if they didn't think there was a problem. Uh, so having spoken to Tom today, once the new processor is installed, he's going to do a BP rollover and then keep a tally manually of every smart post item to check against Horizon. This, however, won't help anything that has gone on previously. And supposing there, if, if Mr. Hedges receives a new processor unit, approaches his, his transactions in the same way, mm -hmm. and he stops getting the discrepancies, that suggests that the processor is at fault. Um, it certainly could have been an explanation, yes. And if he still had discrepancies, um, that would suggest that the processor itself wasn't at fault. May have been something else, may have been the yes. Horizon system, but not the processor. So changing the processor would give you some evidence relevant to determining the cause of the problem. Do you accept that? Um, yes, it could have done, yes. Can we turn to page two, please? Uh, you reply on the 2nd of July. You say, um, Karen, Fujitsu have always had a preventative maintenance policy and therefore sometimes will swap out kit without actually finding a fault. Also, it generally helps with customer perception of the service they have received. I accept in this instance that this policy could work against us, but are you suggesting that if after swapping the processor, 
and all discrepancies cease, that Tom will claim that is clear proof of Horizon creating discrepancies. I strongly suggest that Tom obtains the necessary evidence now if it is available. Pausing there, can we at the same time please show uh, your witness statement, page 11, paragraph 21. And at the, at the very bottom, uh, use, well, it's a, it's a quarter of the way down. You say, I went on to offer advice, which was to obtain evidence prior. Um, I went on to offer advice, which was to obtain evidence prior to requesting that Fujitsu attend site. Fujitsu had, at the time, a basic maintenance policy, which was to replace hardware if they couldn't find an obvious on site fit or fix or explanation. This policy was also likely driven by the need to fix and close calls as quickly as possible, driven by service level targets. In this instance, that would have led to a loss of information, over the page please, contained on that processor that potentially supported the, sub -po the, the postmaster at Hogsworth. Hence my reference to this policy could work against us, that this course of action could lead to an end of investigative options and establishing root cause. In insofar as Fujitsu were, were planning to change the original processor, there was no indication they were going to simply destroy it, was there? No, it went into, um, so processors were recycled. The post office only had so many, um, you know, sufficient to support the branch network with the spares to keep the whole cycle going. So without any um, intervention, that processor would have just simply been swapped, gone back into the recycling process and, and wiped in effect uh, in terms of any information contained on it. But the processor could have been replaced without losing the information and continue the investigation? It could have been, I believe, yes. In, when you're saying this policy could work against us here, are you referring to the loss of investigative options or are you work referring to the fact that it may have shown a problem with the Horizon system? No, it's the first thing. I, I, I was, again, rightly or wrongly at the time, I was really wanting uh, the postmaster to try and gather the evidence so that we could take forward an investigation. The option of simply having the, the, the processor replaced for me was one that I would rather have avoided at the time. Um, I don't know what followed this particular stage of the investigation because I don't believe it was the end of it. Um, but this was only a step in, in, in my believe, my mindset at the time. Let's have one more go at trying to obtain the evidence. Is there anything there that allows me to take that forward in the way that we've discussed earlier with Fujitsu rather than have it um, removed and potentially uh, lost? despite what you just said a few minutes ago, Sam, if we'd have replaced the processor and the new processor didn't display the same symptoms and errors, I believe that there's a pos strong possibility that had equally led to an end to the investigation and there would have been an assumption made that the discrepancies were created in branch rather than the technology. Was this the, not a type of case where keystroke data may have been of assistance? Um, yes, I think it probably would have done on reflection, but don't remember, and clearly haven't mentioned it at this point in time, and I don't remember it being raised subsequently either. Thank you. The, um, if we could take down the witness statement, please, but keep up the, um, the document. If we go um, up to the next page, where, where it's John Breeden's email... Sorry, if we could go to the next page up, please. Thank you. <clears throat> it's an email from John Breeden on the 3rd of July. Um, do you recall who John Breeden was? Again, Retail Network, possibly Karen Arnold's line management chain. More senior. 
As I have read the recent emails on the above and considered the information, I am concerned if we swap the processor now and the errors stop, this could lead to, one, a claim that Horizon has problems in its accuracy and fuel some of the recent press articles, and two, the SPMR will claim that all previous errors are down to Horizon, and we have no way to disprove this uh, if everything is resolved when the new processor uh, is installed. And over the page, it goes on to say, I think we need this one, to think this one through carefully, and the SPMR should be providing evidence to support his claims, uh, which can be investigated before we change pieces of equipment. So at, at this stage, um, was there a general concern in post office affecting investigations uh, about the risk of litigation relating to Horizon? Well, the retail network managers would be better placed to 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 answer that. But um, as maybe I mentioned earlier, I believe you know there was an upward trend in the volume of this type of inquiry, so that would make perfect sense if there was. If we look at that email, I think if we go up, it was on August two thousand and nine. Um, sorry, sorry, July two thousand and nine. Were you aware um, of a Computer Weekly article in May 2009 regarding the robustness of Horizon? Actually, now you mention it, I do. I think that you know was one of the things that um, we were all informed about. Yes, so I think it was brought to our attention as as staff members. And what was said to you in respect of that article? Um, I think it was. Um, and again, I'm sorry. I'm because this is just as you can tell how I believed it was at the time and how we were and how we operated. But I believed, again, we were reassured um, that Horizon was uh, fit for purpose. Sean Turner today gave evidence um, that communications on, on that issue came down from what he thought were board level regarding the robustness of Horizon in response. Um, would, would you agree with that? Y yes. Um, I, I mean, my... The part of the business I worked in is where the message would have come from. Ultimately, I'm a, I would assume it's come from higher, but the IT uh, directorate and function would have been the ones communicating to the likes of myself. And do you think the points mentioned by Mr. Breeden in uh, points one and two here are in any way are, are appropriate considerations to take into account when deciding how to investigate uh, potential discrimination? Well, you know, again, it's passage of time, isn't it? But I'd like, to, it's interesting that John seems to be sort of coming to the same conclusion as me in terms of the process we're following, but for a slightly different reason. Um, my, my entire job was about trying to resolve issues and fix issues on behalf of the post office and the postmasters. Um, you know, not, not to be covering up anything or being negative so for me personally, no, it was not a criteria that was um, necessary in determining what actions we were going to take. Um, could we quickly bring up, please, poll 0012547 at page three? Under the Wednesday entry, this is sorry, a note from Karen Arnold. Uh, it's on the, um, it's on this uh, issue. On the Wednesday entry, it says checked with Paul Kellett and no losses settled centrally on 5th August um, 09. Contacted Tom, who confirmed he'd been short by approximately 40 pounds on last BTS, uh, and had made this good. Advised that Fujitsu have confirmed that they have not found any system errors which would have caused the discrepancies and concluded that there was nothing wrong with the processor. Advised Tom that he needs to provide evidence to support any claims that the problems with losses were as a result of Horizon and that he is responsible for making, good, uh, making the losses good. Uh, so these discrepancies you accept are something for which uh, Mr Hedges could have... W um, well, would have been asked to make them good and, and settle them himself. It certainly looks that way. That's the way I interpret that, yes. And if he didn't, uh, he could face suspension? Uh, I'd like to think not, um, but 
that that was outside of my remit. It was retail network management process. In this case, Mr. Hedges, uh, uh, in in due course, um, was convicted uh, of a, a criminal offence arising from um, these issue, uh, issues relating to discrepancies for which his conviction has been overturned. Were you involved in that element of his? That's news to me. I didn't know that. In this case, um, the fact that Fujitsu said they'd found no problems with the system, uh, we discussed in your evidence earlier that there was no, or, or you didn't have sufficient support uh, internally with IT to check what they were saying, you relied on their expertise. Um, was this a case where you would have gone to someone um, f within I, IT to check on it? I would have liked to have had the opportunity. I really think that that wasn't the case. I don't think that this investigation went I mean, naturally, emails don't record everything. There were lots of conversation, but I think that this pretty much summarises the investigation. Um, I'm going to uh, simply ask you now to turn to page 15 of your statement, please. And in it, you say that um, you've chosen to remain with the IT service industry. And if I've learned one thing during that time, it is that IT can and does fail, that people are fallible and make mistakes. It is how you respond to those circumstances that matter. Openness and honesty is and always will be the best policy. Uh, clearly, there were occasions when the benefit of doubt could and should have been given. I'm sickened by what I've read post my time at post office and have experienced a wave of emotions from sadness, shame and anger. Do you think that the post office should have been more open and honest? Uh, benefit of hindsight in some respects, but yes, clearly. If so, how, how, in what ways? I think I can only try and convey what I thought my role was um, and it wasn't to cover up any issues with technology. It was to ensure that we were providing a quality service to the British public through the branch network, and that includes the independent network. Everything I ever tried to do and my team tried to do was for that end and that benefit. To watch the programme as I did two years ago on TV and see people rather than fad codes. It was, it was difficult. Apologies. There's no need to apologise, but if you wish to take a moment, please do so. It's hard for me to reconcile years down the line in my mind, given all the evidence that we've gone through today with me, let alone what I'm sure you've gone through throughout the inquiry, how, how the HR and the human element was so misaligned. It almost feels to me that there was some disconnect between the reality of what we were all trying to manage in the, in the right way for the right reasons and, and, and the impact and, and the outcome, I, I just cannot understand, probably because I wasn't part of that part of the business, I didn't see what retail network managers had to go through, the policies that they had, you know, I wasn't, I'm not even familiar with a, a sub-postmaster's contract, for example. But I still find it very hard for you to tell me that the gentleman at Hogsworth, you know, suffered in that way off the back of something where there was clearly an element of doubt. And I think that's the thing for me. There was doubt, despite the messages, despite Horizon has no integrity issues, messages constantly coming down. Clearly there's evidence to say that there were some problems, that there were risks involved, 
and they may have been small in the greater context as in the volume of, I appreciate the impact has been huge on individuals, but I find that I, I simply can't reconcile it in my own mind now today, I'm afraid. Hence, hence the emotional words I've used there. Um, and that's where the anger comes from as well. I work very hard. Mr. Blackburn, I don't have any further questions, but is there anything further you would like to say before I ask if the core participants? No, I'm just hope that it's of use. Are there any other questions? Sir, I just would like to follow on with the rest of what um, is actually in the same paragraph that Mr. Stevens has just referred to, if I may. All right. It's very brief. Yeah. At the end of that same paragraph, um, you said that um, if you'd had more visibility of the action that was taken against sub-postmasters, you hope that you would have found the courage to challenge, sound a note of caution, and promote the communication of outcomes more vigorously and robustly than I perhaps did. Yes. My question is simply, what do you think the reaction of those above you would have been if you had? Well, I think the fact that I didn't probably gives you your answer. I don't think highly politicised organisation, very hierarchical, I'd have been seen as stepping out of line with the message. Um, I can't imagine that that would have been good for my career. So I'm sure at that point in time, and this is obviously a hindsight reflection, um, I obviously on occasions chose to unconsciously protect myself. Thank you. That's all I wanted to ask. Thank you, uh, Ms. Page. Um, and thank you, Mr. Blackburn, for um, first of all giving a witness statement and secondly answering a, a good deal of questions this afternoon. And um, I'm grateful to you for the frankness which with, with which you've expressed some of your emotions. So um, I'm glad we were able to complete today. I'm sure that's a great relief to you. And I'll see everybody else at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes, thank you, sir. And we, we're hearing from Anne Alaka and Gail Peacock. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir.